This is a production of Cornell University. It's on. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. So I won't use my FM DJ voice today. <laughs> I need a bigger microphone. Um, so yeah, so I've talked about the Broccoli Project here quite a number of times over the years, but I realize in this venue I haven't talked about my cover crop work, even though I talk about it nearly every week to some audience during the fall and early winter. So I thought this would be a good chance, and especially as it impinges on the work that a lot of you are doing, uh, and sort of reinforce the connections that we have around some of these questions of production and biology. And so my big goal with the uh, cover crop work is to make vegetable production more environmentally and economically sustainable. So that's kind of the big picture. And you'll find that everything probably fits into that big picture and there'll be a lot of uh, smaller threads. Uh, so most of the work in cover crops when I started was done for field crops. And field crops are very, very constrained. They get planted in the spring. As soon as you can get in the ground, they get harvested when the weather starts to get lousy in the fall. And that doesn't make for a very exciting cover crop scenario. Vegetables are really different. And so some of the things that really play into how you think about putting cover crops into a vegetable production. All right, one thing is that it's very high revenue. So on the plus side for somebody who's trying to change practices is that if, it's, if what you're doing is useful, it's worth spending money on. So people are more likely to adopt it. On the other hand, if it messes things up, uh, it can cause growers, cost growers a lot of money. Uh, and it also, in some of the decision-making, getting the crop off the field is even more important because you can easily have a situation that we have a lot, field is too wet, crop is ripe, what do you do? Well, if you have $10,000 worth of crop on land that costs $5,000 an acre, what's your call? You're gonna go in there and rut it up, no doubt about it. That's terrible for soil health get to in a moment, uh, but that's going to be the decision. So you end up uh, with people doing things for short-term benefit that are bad for the long-term. Uh, vegetables compared to other crops produce very little organic matter, so there's a need to supplement that with other things in the uh, cropping system. Tillage is traditionally very intense with vegetables compared to most other crops, certainly compared to fruits. Uh, even even better, bigger contrast than with field crops. Uh, and I'll talk about the issues with tillage as we get into it. Uh, it's a very high fertility setting, it, particularly when you're harvesting before seed maturity. If the crop is still green and growing, it wants a high nitrogen environment. And so you're harvesting when there's high nitrogen, you're leaving a high nitrogen residue. So nitrogen management becomes quite different from a field crop that you're harvesting at crop maturity when if you've done it right, you've run the soil nitrogen down to practically zero. Um, and there are very diverse rotations. Vegetable crop producer generally is trying to harvest for as much of the season as possible so that you get paid for as much of the season as possible. Trying to, you know, here we can grow tomatoes, great, and deliver all kinds of tomatoes the second week in September, but if that's all you got, you have no market. So you have harvest all season. Well, for cover crops, that provides a lot of different opportunities, and it also creates the need for a lot of different solutions. So I'll give examples of some of those. So I should uh, say here my, my motivation for really getting into uh, the cover crops in a big way, I'd been playing around with it before, um, was Carol McNeil. So she uh, retired uh, a couple of years ago from uh, cooperative extension, but she was really a key player in the soil health program uh, and really worked very hard at getting cover crop adoption and especially important to me, identifying very precisely what the needs of the growers were. So where, where could I, in doing research in this area, uh, provide more information? And so finding that highest unaddressed grower need. So, she was a really good partner in making sure I was doing something useful uh, and understanding how to develop a curriculum of information that's useful to the extension educators. So it's not research reports, it's not a little fact here and a little fact there. It's here's a set of ideas, a set of practices that you can actually learn and use. And so that was uh, 
really important to my development and extension. Um, and partnering with the soil health team, you'll see that a lot of this is structured around soil health practices. Um, sort of another kind of introductory uh, notion, uh, there's something about our geography and kind of where my partnerships have been in doing this work. So the uh, blue and green on here is, those are alpha sols. Those are the really high quality, highly productive soils. And you see they run across the Ontario Plain uh, over into Michigan quite a bit. So um, Geneva and Lansing are really very similar in many regards. Uh, quite a bit of work with uh, Michigan State. Um, so we've got that band. And so uh, and having Geneva right in the, the middle of that spot makes it convenient, not only because our, our land is just like the farmer's land, but the farmers are right there to work with. I'd say my, my work is intended to influence the colorful areas on this map. Um, and uh, yeah, so some, some thought that these can be sort of takeaways if you want some practical things out of this talk. Um, so one of the things I've tried to focus on is making sure that the cover crop is managed, is matched to the management goal, that the growers really need to have something they are trying to accomplish that is difficult to do with the tool, the other tools that they have. So bringing in a cover crop to do biologically what they're having trouble doing with their other set of tools. Um, different cover crops do different things, different times of the season, so finding the right one and identifying exactly what the management goal is sometimes takes uh, some shifts in thinking. Um, another one, it's really important to reduce tillage if you want the cover crops to do much good. And that's something that's become more and more clear to me over the past 10 years. And I'll show you some examples of that. So coupling uh, with the reduced tillage and vegetable program. So Ani's not here, Brian, Brian, they're doing really, really important work. And so tying the two ideas in those two programs together is important. And with the cover crops, timing is really critical. And usually growers think about cover crops. Oh, I'll get it in when I get around to it. And that doesn't work any better for cover crops than it does for other time sensitive things. But so I'll start off with soil health because that's been a real organizing principle of this. And it's a place where you really have an opportunity uh, to have um, considerable improvement. In fact, one of the uh, cynical statements about the soil health report is that you get a prescription for what to do and typically it's reduce tillage and use more cover crops. So uh, some, some people, why do I need the test if that's what it's going to tell me? Uh, but it tells you which things to do, what the specific management goal is. And so here are the soil health test report, here are the uh, eight indicators, four physical ones and four biological ones uh, that are typically coming out of the report and these can be addressed with reduced tillage and cover crops in different ways. And with cover crops, it's really different cover crops uh, for each of those uh, indicators. And they're related to one another. And I'm not gonna dwell on this one. In fact, I'm just gonna focus on the aggregate stability one for today in order to squeeze everything in. Uh, so aggregate stability is the soil's aggregation. And to kind of give you a picture of what that can look like, um, so the bad crumb here is what ground looks like if you till it a lot, don't put in enough organic matter and drive on it when it's wet. Um, it falls apart, so there are no crumbs in it. There are no air spaces in it. If you try to break that apart, it will break into big clods and it'll break into the individual mineral particles. Uh, so that's uh, unfortunately taken out of a vegetable field. And this is good crumb. This is soil that was taken next to a vegetable field. It hadn't been tilled, it was in the hedgerow, so it looked like that. But you can see those crumbs, they work like little ball bearings, so you can break up the soil easily, it tills fairly easily. These stick together because they're very well glued together. That's what we want. That provides a lot more air spaces for the roots to grow for respiration and for the soil biology to work. And this is a picture of where those aggregates come from. So in this case, we're working with buckwheat, uh, which was the first cover crop I chose to work with because we've been doing buckwheat grain stuff. Um, and so this is the outside of the root. These are the root hairs you see going out. 
And you see there's all kinds of the mineral particles in the soil, all kinds of different sizes, right? That's important. They're stuck together to different extents. Now, the cool thing about this picture is that it's the soil sheet. So what Margaret did to get this picture was she pulled the, the root gingerly out of the soil, and then she washed it with water. And this is what's stuck to the root. This doesn't come off. And what's happened is the root has pushed, so water's coming out of the root, kind of make that point, with a bunch of mucopolysaccharides produced by the root surface, pushed out here, and that glues this stuff together. And that's about as far as the, the water could get. Well, it pushes a bunch of other things out there. So this is food for all the biology of the rhizosphere. And one of the cool things about Cornell is that there are at least a dozen labs working very hard on what's going on in there. Who's there? What are they doing? What do they like? How can we do good? How can we have them do good things for us? So there's tremendous activity right here about what's going on in this picture, which I find very exciting. It's going to lead to answers I want to know. Um, so the first uh, set of experiments I'm going to talk about, we're trying to figure out which cover crop would be most helpful for improving soil health and aggregate stability in particular, which we're going to talk about here. Um, so there's a bunch of cover crops available. They have fine root systems, coarse root systems. They grow at different times of year. They secrete different things. Uh, so in terms of just practical, we want to move our aggregate stability up. What should we use? We looked at two main windows. One is after an early vegetable crop, so that we'd be planting around the 20th of July. And then for a mid-season cover crop, planting around the 20th of August. And we didn't worry about later than that. These were the two time frames that were of most uh, interest. And so we put this experiment in where we had the same cover crop for four off seasons in a row. And we had different vegetables in each of the years. So after four years, how much change were we able to produce? We knew that it was unlikely we'd see anything in one year. So we went for four, uh, planting the same crop four times in a row. Didn't want to push it any further than that, so that was enough. Uh, and then looked at various measures of soil health and uh, crop performance. And just to orient you a little bit, um, this is from the soil health handbook, kind of what's good, bad, and terrible. So with wet aggregate stability um, on a medium soil is the dotted line. Um, so if, you're, if you want green good, you want an aggregate stability of at least about, well, so in the 30s here. But the two fields I was using were down here. They were about 18 and 20. They were definitely in the red zone. So they were in bad shape, one worse than the other. So the question is, can we put them out, push them out of the really bad zone, at least into the not so terrible zone? Uh, so we're asking a lot of the cover crop at this point but also a fairly common situation. Um, so this is with the early summer cover crops. So the two colored bars are the two different fields. Um, and the first one is with where we had bare ground in the off season, uh, so just open fallow. So these are the aggregate stability values after four years with the basically current practice. And then use yellow mustard, buckwheat, Sudan grass, annual ryegrass, and these are sort of in order of how big the root system is. So thinking that a bigger root system might have a bigger effect. And what we find is that there's some hints, but nothing is really coming out as statistically significant. And um, if you're getting an improvement of 1% a year, to get up to 40 is going to be a long haul. So it's even, even if it's moving, it's not moving very fast with these early summer ones. Um, so these three are only in the ground for about two and a half months. The early summer is nice because you get the long days and warm temperatures of July and August to work with. Uh, annual ryegrass actually survives into the spring, so it's working longer, uh, but not. <coughs> 
moving this measurement. These are the late summer cover crops. Um, so again, the bare ground first, so that's the control. But here we get to use more. We've got radish, yellow mustard, and turnip. So those are all crucifers. They're all dying sometime during the winter. Uh, Ryan treated Kaylee are uh, winter grains. And finally, annual ryegrass um, is a turf type, so it makes a, a finer um, sod root system there. Um, and the rye one kind of looks tempting. It's a very commonly used one. Um, but even with that one, I'm, I'm a little wary of it because triticale is almost exactly the same thing. And so if we had something that was going to be consistent, I would want to see triticale up there. So what we're seeing in this highly tilled system is that even cover cropping very aggressively for four years, it's really hard to move the needle. Uh, and if you're planning on doing a master's degree project and starting from scratch, this may not be the type of experiment you want to do. Uh, so what's the, the deal with the tillage here? So we were tilling to plant the crop and we were tilling to incorporate the residue of the crop and prepare the ground for the cover crop. Uh, so that's quite a bit of tillage in a year. So this is a paper that is about to come out from a colleague in Tennessee. Um, so they're working on a similar soil. And uh, there they've done wheat and vetch as their off-season cover crops. And when they're, and so this measures the infiltration rate of water, which is pretty closely related to the aggregate stability. Um, so they moved it from an inch and a half with the fallow up to a little over two inches with the two cover crops. So a little bit of an effect. And since rains in that range are really potentially problematic, that matters. But look what happens when you stop tilling. Much bigger increase in the water infiltration. And what do the cover crops do when you stop tilling? Much bigger impact. Having five inches of infiltration would be amazing here. That's a lot of water that just goes into the ground, doesn't run off. Uh, but the thing is, this is after 34 years. So that's a long time. Presumably something happened before 34 years, but we know that by 34 years something has happened. Uh, and Harold Van Ness's group has a trial similar to this going on up in Aurora. And I think they're five years into it or so. And it's, it's starting to get interesting looking. Um, but they're, it's not going to pull away like this for a few more years by the looks of it. Um, so what can we do to reduce tillage and vegetables if we're going to take advantage of this effect? How should we be thinking of this instead of adding cover crops to overcome the tillage thing? That's probably not the way it works. It's, we have to use cover crops to avoid the need for tillage. Um, and so thinking about what's going on structurally in the soil. Um, so this is our tilled soil when it's reconsolidated. So we fluff it up to plant stuff, but it has very little aggregate stability and structural properties. So it reconsolidates like that after, by the end of the season, it's compacted again. Uh, and so we keep fluffing it up, growing stuff and having it fall together. Um, so that's, that's why it's hard to make progress. What, is, what does no-till end up looking like? Just having a picture in your head of what reducing tillage looks like. And this is one um, that I dug up. So here we're starting to get worm holes. There's some root holes coming through there. The worms can go in where there's been a bigger root. Um, so those things are happening when the soil is wetter than it is in this picture. Um, but you can see that it's starting to develop a structure where it can support weight. You can support your equipment, um, but it's still perforated. And so the, the source of the air spaces is really different than what you get when you do tillage. So this is what we're trying to drive for. So getting those root holes in there is really important and then leaving it alone. And over a long period of time, 10 to 34 years, is when you're starting to get so much perforation that it actually starts to behave the way you want it to. And that choosing a cover crop to work with this or to do that sort of thing is important. Here's 
um, an example of different root systems. This is millet and sorghum Sudan grass. If you look at the seedlings when they're coming up, you can't tell the difference. They look really alike. Uh, but you look at those root systems. If you want a fine root system with a lot of surface area, millet's your cover crop. But if you want really strong, thick roots that can punch through a compacted soil, sorghum Sudan grass has the thick roots that can do that. Uh, so the choice is really important, even though you know, they're right next to each other in the seed catalog and they look alike. It's easy to say, well, they're out of the Sudan grass, I'll get the millet. Well, you've got to match the cover crop with the purpose that you have. And I can't do this talk without showing the aptly named tillage radish. So um, if you pay any attention whatsoever to cover crops in this neck of the woods for the last five years, you will have heard a lot about tillage radish. It's all the rage. Um, I've got a neighbor farmer who plants about 1,500 acres of it each year. Um, he's field cropper, but it's working for him. Uh, and so what everybody notices is, wow, it's a big old daikon radish. That makes a big old two inch hole in the ground, which is nice, but it's not actually that deep. This really is where, where the dirt stops. That's really the soil level. So it's only going down a couple of inches. Uh, so the action really is the little tap roots. And they have strong gravitropism and they keep trying to grow straight down. I should have rotated the picture to talk about gravitropism, but there you go. You're looking from above. Um, so they're a couple of millimeters wide, but a couple of millimeters wide to punch a hole, that's big enough to get the worms through. It's big enough to get the beetles through, the springtails, all the mesofauna, as it's called. Uh, they can move around. Uh, in the different parts of the soil and open up the soil profile much better. Thomas, in the, the previous picture, does the Sudan sorghum, do those roots normally go down that deep or is that only because they were grown in like the cylinder? Right, the cylinder helps, no question. Uh, but the, um, the Sudan grass actually does have a pretty strong imperative to grow downward. Uh, it varies a lot. They have, roots have a lot of cues, so gravity, light, water, nutrients. There's a lot of things telling them where it's worth putting more roots and they prioritize and some things just naturally prioritize gravity more and the radish is one that puts that pretty high up on the list. You know, physical restriction is one. They like to turn sideways if they hit something hard. And Thomas, is that daikon root harvestable, harvestable and commercially viable? Um, well, yeah, can you eat them? They're perfectly fine to eat. I've eaten them. There's no problem there. Um, now, the seed companies that sell vegetable seed will sell you daikon radish seed at $175 a pound. And the cover crop companies will sell you tillage radish seed at $3 a pound. So I'll, I'll let you guess what the, what the vegetable companies are going to tell you. Uh, so they are, um, they're not quite the quality that will let you compete in the high-end daikon radish farmers market restaurant sales part, um, but it's a perfectly good daikon radish. Uh, so the, where I'm left on this tillage question is how can cover crops aid reduce tillage? And this is a picture of one example where this has, is uh, after harvest in the fall, planting rye in the between crop row spaces, and planting radish in the crop row spaces. The rye is going to survive the winter and provide a good cover. The radish is going to grow, uh, open up the rooting zone below the radish, and then it's going to die. And it will have completely decomposed by springtime. So you'll have a seed zone already formed. It may not require any tillage at all, or it may require very, very gentle tillage in the spring. The rye can stay there until you're ready for it to be done and then you can terminate it with an herbicide. Um, and one of the technologies that we have now that I'm having a lot of fun with is the GPS steering so that you can plant this with your GPS. And I've seen 100 acre fields planted absolutely dead straight. That's eerie. Uh, but then the following year you can come in and plant your crop exactly where the radishes were. 
not half an inch over exactly where they were. Um, and even if the rye was killed early and is mostly decomposed by the time you're coming out to plant, you still hit it perfectly. And you can come back to that spot the following year and the year after that and the year after that. Yeah. Um, with the discussion of broccoli, if you use crucifers, do you build up your flea beetle population? Oh, you're, oh, you're asking that. Yeah, so the, the, ro the whole rotation question, I mean, it's, uh, so the question was whether uh, with crucifers, you have to worry about carrying over flea beetles to the subsequent crop if you're going, growing a cold crop. And yes, absolutely, that's a problem. So you have to choose rotation crops appropriately so that they are compatible in the rotation sequence, further complicating your vegetable rotation. Uh, so that is, that's a specific challenge. You have a lot of constraints that come in. Uh, but I see this sort of thing as having lots of promise uh, for vegetables. And I did some uh, trials this year where we took these highly compacted fields and we did the deep zone tillage that Anu's program has been working quite a bit on. Uh, for vegetables and uh, planted beans, which are some of the wimpiest vegetables out there. And they did great first year out. Uh, so the idea would be to have, to just go cold turkey on this middle zone and just stop killing it and do deep zone tillage in that part as long as it needs it, but also use the cover crop so that that tillage is more effective or can be done more gently. So that is very much the direction I see us going on soil health and cover crops and vegetables, intimately tied in uh, with the reduced tillage. Uh, so I'm going to switch over now to some questions that growers have to get adoption. So the, their first question is, where can I buy the seed? Uh, but the other major question is, when should I plant it? Uh, and so the time to match the cover crop to the planting date, you need to get a fast start. You need to have it during a part of the season where it produces enough biomass. And uh, you also need to have it during a part of the season so it will not produce seed because cover crop seeds make wonderful weeds. And so we don't want those. Uh, so having ones that die or can be killed before they make seeds is important and, uh, because they're day length and temperature sensitive. But that can be fairly predictable. And I'm just showing this is this slide is in every grower talk I give because if, if you know how to farm, you know how to get a fast start, you know how to get no gaps, and you know how to kill things. So if you want to be successful with cover crops, make sure you do those things, and then you're likely to do well. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the fast start as the main part we're getting to here. So this is what a fast start looks like with buckwheat. That's a, cover crop I'm going to talk with in this experiment. So four days, uh, you may see it looks a little yellow. So the, co the cotyledons are up on the fourth day after planting. Um, at three weeks, essentially full cover. At five weeks, time to kill. You see the difference in color between three weeks and five weeks? That color change is dramatic and it's the signal to kill buckwheat if you're doing cover cropping. Unmistakable. But so that three weeks full cover, that's part of the smothering effect of cover crops. If, you're, if uh, weed management is part of your uh, program for sure. And generally speaking, you don't want weeds in your cover crop anyway. But What's the seeding rate? The seeding rate on something like this, this is uh, 60 to 70 pounds an acre. There's this one, 60 pounds an acre. So it's not, not very high. It's just nice uniform seed placement. So we wanted to find out when during our growing season can you plant buckwheat. And so one of, this is the fast start parameter. So we're measuring ground cover at three weeks. So somewhat arbitrarily saying that 70% ground cover at three weeks is good. So that's, that's the number we're trying to hit. So I've got the horizontal line across there. And three very different seasons produce some different curves. Um, but in short, having it, uh, so in the fall, in, sorry, in the, in May, it's really too cool and it grows slowly. It likes a little bit warmer. And so the weeds during, during May, uh, plantings 
the weeds will, the early season weeds will beat the buckwheat pretty consistently. Um, but if you get into June and July and early August, it's looking good for a fast start. So that's pretty long season. Uh, and then the other one is getting enough biomass. And so here we're looking at the biomass at 42 days. So that's when we would typically kill it. Um, and June and July still look pretty good. But once you get into August, there's a, an abrupt drop. And basically that's because it gets cold in September and it stops growing in September. So it's, even though it came out of the ground like a rocket because it was warm and wet in early July, it slams on the brakes once you get into, sep into uh, September. So the August plantings don't actually do well. And um, so the thing is, if you're, you're busy, you're, this is crazy time of year for vegetable growers and you're harvesting and the end of July feels just like the beginning of August. But the difference between putting your buckwheat in here and putting your buckwheat in there is the difference between success and failure. It's really important to hit the date right. So we had a lot of data like that and we developed a degree day model uh, to figure out when the planting date is that you can get both a fast start and enough biomass. And uh, through the climate centers, uh, we worked up a map for um, actually covering the Midwest as well uh, for the last effective uh, planting date of buckwheat. Uh, the thing that struck me about this map is that if you look in the Midwest, you can see that the date zones, the borders between the date zones pretty much follow the interstates. So you can say, oh, it's this date if you're north of Interstate 7. But if you're trying to talk about New York or New England, it's completely modeled. It's really hard. So you need some sort of a, uh, a local map or something to tell you for a particular farm, what uh, are you going for? Um, the other thing that shows up pretty clearly is that uh, down here at Beltsville, where a lot of cover crop work gets done, they're dealing with a completely different situation. Very, very different timing for that region. Um, so I also have worked a lot on the crucifer cover crops, uh, which we never use in broccoli production because of the weed beetles and other reasons. Uh, but they're, um, they're popular for a couple of reasons. One is that they're cheap to use. Seeds cost a dollar to three, four dollars. You use um, five or 10 pounds per acre. So the, the seed cost ends up being relatively low. And just the amount of stuff you have to bring out there is fairly low with the small seeds. Um, uh, the rye you're planting maybe 150, 200 pounds an acre. Um, seeds are in the similar range. So you can imagine if you have a 50 acre field, this is a lot of stuff you're hauling out and driving around the field with. With the crucifers, it's a lot less, uh, much easier. And for the vegetable systems, remember I said that you're harvesting when the nitrogen levels are still really high, both in the soil and the crop residue. But these are great scavengers of nitrogen. And so they will, they're a good tool for soaking up that excess nitrogen, carrying it over to the next year so it's not lost. And so we did some similar work with mustard. Um, so this is with Dan Brainerd in, um, at Michigan State. We're, um, it's the Kellogg Biological Station in the Freeville farm here. So both sites um, had certified organic land that we could work on an organic um, funded project. Um, and weed control in the fall is especially interesting to organic growers. Um, and here again, you can see uh, that abrupt drop uh, from getting good biomass to getting very little. So again, very, very abrupt window closing and so there we do develop the degree day model. And um, so the buckwheat model looks very similar to this. Um, and what you can see in this model is that there's a lot of degree days when it's nothing, 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 nothing. And then fairly quickly it comes up and makes however big it's going to be. Um, and they collect more degree days in Michigan um, also. And that was something we noticed consistently that uh, they're uh, 
they have would usually catch a little more season. But in both locations, uh, that rise happened about the same place. So we could do a model for that also. So we have basically the uh, same kind of map, but now developed for mustard. Uh, and that's thankfully a little bit simpler here in New York. So making uh, statements about when to plant the, uh, the mustard cover crops. And we've tested a bunch of different crucifers and they're all the same from the super uh, frost sensitive radish to the really, really cold hardy winter canola. And even though their winter hardiness varies, the, the degree day requirement for growth in the fall is exactly the same on all of them. So the last planting date applies to all the fruits, but it's not just mustard, which is helpful. So we went another step along uh, for helping the growers. So this is with Eddie O'Neill and Brian Belcher with Cornell Climate Smart Farming, which you can find a bunch of tools at climatesmartfarming.org. They're doing really nifty stuff. And so this is one of a set of tools that they have that's tied in with the cover crop decision tool that I've put online. And it, it, you pick your location, so not everybody gets Ithaca. You, you can put your farm, your field. If it's a big farm, you can put different fields. Some people are at different elevations. And so we've got this for uh, mustard, rye, and buckwheat. And it says, what's the probability of success? And here I define what success is. Um, and it will show you the curve of your odds of success. And if you mouse along there, so I have the mouse on August 31st here, it tells you you have a 27% chance of success. Um, if you're, you can see the history since uh, 1978, how many years, uh, there were enough growing degree days by that planting date. So some people like to gamble more than others. So that gives you the exact, you know, how risky is it? Uh, and this is the scary part to me. Uh, the dark line here is the 15 year average and the gray line is the 30 year average. So it counts another 15 years back in history. So that difference re represents how much warmer the last 15 years have been than the previous 15 years. That's a big difference. And it shows up on all of the, throughout the Northeast, all the locations we've tried, it shows up to different extents with all of the cover crops that have different degree day models, it shows up. So anyway, we're providing growers with tools like this. Um, and even though they're targeted pretty narrowly to New York vegetable growers, it's not a huge group in the audience, it gets used 50 to 100 times a day year round. So there's, the adoption is quite high. So that's been um, pretty rewarding. So let's show a little bit about weed suppression, which is another management goal, not soil health. Um, and the fast start, so you want the cover crop, buckwheat here, come up faster than the weeds. And in this picture, it didn't. If I saw this, I'd say, whoops, let's try that again. Um, so here is a trial we did with buckwheat with the question, how much tillage do you actually need in order to get a buckwheat cover crop established effectively enough to suppress the weeds for the rest of the growing season? So this is after a pea harvest, so they come off fairly early in the season. Um, and in this, the uh, green is the buckwheat cover crop. Orange are the weeds that come up in the cover crop. And yellow is the weed pressure. So that's how much weeds were there if we didn't have a cover crop there. And with no-till, you can see that the weeds grow just as happily as they would have otherwise. And the buckwheat doesn't really grow very well because it has such a fine root system that just straight no-till, it goes into ground that's too hard and there are uh, germinated weeds present already. Uh, but disking enough to just kill the weeds and provide a little bit of a seed bed, now you get pretty good buckwheat growth and you get uh, pretty good uh, suppression of the weeds. So that's planted immediately after tillage. So the, the rule of thumb is wait a couple of weeks. So we're violating that rule clearly. 
Uh, we did a chisel treatment also in case there was going to be puddling, but that turned out not to happen. So it's essentially the same treatment there um, and essentially the same result. And then when we waited a week, so the buckwheat actually liked that. Um, and we did get great weed suppression then, uh, but we did it a couple of other years and it, we started to see some weed germination. If you wait the two weeks, this is actually weeds that have now germinated by the time you plant. So you're not getting a fast start relative to the weeds and having um, that much weed biomass is actually worrisome because it's in your cover crop and it could be going to seed uh, later. So that's, even though it's not a real big bar, it's, it's a problem. So we don't want that. So what we're saying is you can, after you've harvested a vegetable, you need enough tillage to kill weeds, get a seed bed, um, but that's it, no more. And don't wait, plant the cover crop right away to maximize your growth. Tried it later in the fall with the mustard system. And here the, um, the line is how big the cover crop was. The, Blue bar is the weed pressure, so how many weeds were there. This is the uh, weed biomass. And the red ones are how much it is with mustard. So if you see a big difference between the blue bar and the red bar, that means the mustard was working. And so early in the season when the mustard's big, you're getting some weed suppression, but also some significant weed growth uh, in the mustard. Um, so this is Michigan, this is New York. Uh, the one Thing we're finding is when we go late into the season, we're, you know, we're not getting great weed suppression, but we're getting a lot of weed suppression even when the mustard is really small in the fall. So there's some good competition happening right away when the mustard comes out of the ground and is competing with those weed seedlings. And it's not so much in those about the growth afterwards. Um, and then we ask the questions, are um, specific weeds being suppressed. You can easily think that it's that the cover crop targets certain weeds and not other weeds. And if we look at just all weed numbers that come up after you've incorporated the cover crop, um, we're finding that it's essentially the same. So 100% means there's no difference. Um, so we compared mustard and no mustard. Um, but for uh, something like lamb's quarters, we're seeing a reduction by half. So not great, but helpful. Uh, and then we tested a high glucosinolate mustard against a low glucosinolate mustard, thinking that this is the biofumigation effect. So in the, in the West and other long season areas, uh, they do biofumigation with uh, mustards that are high in glucosinolates. So this is to try to assess how big is the effect of biofumigation versus all the other effects that the cover crop has. And we found no difference. In fact, we found no difference ever. Um, so, my thought is that biofumigation isn't really what we're doing. So you don't have to worry about that in our region. Um, but we go to a couple of other weeds and um, they like mustard. Mustard stimulates their germination. Um, so it can go either way. And a couple of others that we were worried about um, had even smaller effects. So we're not seeing super dramatic specific effects here on the, on the weeds that come up after the cover crop is imposed. So I'm gonna skip that one and go to the take home messages. So as you're thinking about the cover crop work that I'm doing, how it impinges on your work. So think about using cover crops to assist your efforts to reduce tillage. That's a good context. Um, and if you're studying the uh, effects of cover crops, um, it's helpful to look at it in the context of your production system. So a lot of the things I talked about here, we came up with a different answer from the place where that system was originally developed because our constraints are different, the answers are different. So if you're gonna be useful to the audience locally here, you need to test it in the system with the constraints that we have. Um, Understanding the mechanics, like the allele uh, the biofumigation I just showed on the last slide, understanding something about the mechanics, you know, how, how does the transition into no tillage 
work? What's going on in the soil? Or how are you getting the higher uh, infiltration rates, for instance? Uh, and I have to repeat, fast start, no gaps, kill on time, seven words. You got those words? <laughs> Do you remember nothing else? Um, and uh, then fitting the cover crops into the production system in as many places as possible to try to achieve that year round roots that are gonna keep feeding that soil biota that's so interesting and we'll all be learning more about in the few years to come. Uh, and in doing this work, I've collaborated with a bunch of people. So there's a ton, or I think it comes to about a ton and a half of collaborators um, that have been particularly involved in this project. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for your attention. Why not? Questions? <laughs> so we grow garlic and then put buckwheat on after the garlic. Uh -huh rotate it with something else next year um we never we often don't kill our buckwheat yeah so it seems like okay well we're we're saving a tillage yeah but our, what are the benefits or the disadvantages of not i mean and we don't really we don't really have a weed problem with right buckwheat. yeah but like are we putting are we losing nitrogen and organic matter by right. not killing it Right, so the question is killing on time. So garlic is pulled out fairly early in the season, so you have time to plant buckwheat. The buckwheat uh, grows up nicely. It has very different root system and disease profile from uh, the garlic. It suppresses the weeds for the rest of the summer, uh, but a lot more than 42 days. So, okay, it's flowering. It's making seeds. So it didn't get killed on time the way I described it. But what Donna also said, we don't really have a problem with weeds, presumably buckwheat being in that. So it, it is making seeds, but the rest of your management is taking care of the weed seedlings that result. Uh, it cultivates really easily. So some people don't worry about them. And so in your case, killing on time is whenever the frost gets them. Yeah. And then you have a no-tillage system and in the springtime you have good, good conditions. So do you use, um, do you use like nitrogen that you put back in the soil? Yeah, so um, with buckwheat, you probably do lose nitrogen over the season because um, in, it will decompose a lot during the winter. So as long as it remains protein uh, into the spring, it's likely to stay in the system. But if it decomposes to the point where you have nitrates or even, uh, even amino acids to some extent, um, the nitrate will denitrify any time you have saturated soil, which you will have guaranteed sometime before planting. And, uh, and it also leach out if there's, if there's leaching going on. So there's a, the uh, amino acids will also uh, leach out of the organic matter. So if it's trying to keep it from decomposing too much before springtime is the goal. And buckwheat is going to decompose long before spring. Yeah. Geneva has any questions? Yeah, no, I have been yeah. talking do you know how long it will take for you to get a seed from buckwheat? Uh, yeah, so how long does it take to get the seed from buckwheat? Uh, so the the 42 day thing is actually um, very closely related to that because uh, you start getting um, viable embryos very soon after that. And a lot of the times if you kill buckwheat by mowing, there's little, um, branches that are left with the seed heads and they'll actually sit there and mature and so you can produce quite a lot of seeds uh, from those while they're decomposing well while the rest of the plant is decomposing the seed are maturing so even though it would typically be 70 days until you harvested commercial seed um, killing it at even 50 days you're likely to get seeds um, out of that one pretty touchy um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about a little bit about this idea of like how um, spatially distributed those compaction occur. Like, are we talking like is there generally uniform compaction? Uh -huh. And how does the mechanism of these roots uh, growing down through there actually break it up? Is it like are you sort of like just kind of punching a hole through it and shoving the the soil to the side, which kind of recompacts right. the soil right. laterally, or 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the structure of the compaction. Um, well, we have a, a couple of uh, compaction tools that we use a lot. One is the moldboard plow. And so as it goes along, it's actually lifting the soil. That's a big heave. So the counteracting force is pushing against the soil downward with the plowshare. And so that is where the plow pan comes from. And um, if it's at all moist down there, and here it's usually moist down there, that creates a pretty uniform compaction plow pan that, that will be uniform across the field. It'll be uh, thicker where the soil was wetter. So if there are wet, wetter spots in the field, which is typical of our fields, they'll be worse. Our other tool is the, the disc. And that, that's at a much shallower level, but it scours as it goes across. So it can make this nice glossy area just, just below the seed couple of inches down so they can come down and hit that. Um, so for um, having the cover crops grow through, um, it's really the lower one, uh, the plow pan I think you're thinking about. Um, and there, uh, yes, they would be pushing sideways, so it's been compacted vertically. So ultimately you would want to be moving the soil up and having the air spaces take up that space. Um, and um, that's really the only direction you can push. So eventually it will get there, but as the roots go through, yes, yeah, they are pushing radially around the roots. So it sounds like these roots maybe aren't necessarily like completely eliminating the compaction. Um, no, they're perforating the compaction, is how I think about it. Yeah. The impacts. Right. Action, right. Yes. Yeah. So Brother. we're out of time. I want to thank Thomas again for a wonderful lecture. <laughs> This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.